generous view is that you are a young man who made a series of terrible, terrible, very, very bad decisions. The less generous view is that you have committed a massive fraud, that this is a Ponzi scheme. Did you know that FTX deposits were used to pay off Alameda creditors? Uh, Good morning. Thank you for coming back. If you're new to the channel, who loves you, baby? Listen, this is going to be a great video. We're going to go through current crypto news. Okay. We're going to go through Sam Bankman Fried's interview with Andrew Sorkin of CNBC at the New York Times Dealbook Summit. We're going to talk about what Chair Gary Gensler of the SEC is thinking and talking about about a framework for crypto regulation. We're gonna go through what Mike Novogratz says should happen to Sam Bankman-Fried. And we are gonna go through new on-chain data and much, much more. So let's get started and welcome to the wheelhouse. Okay, and before we go too deep down this rabbit hole and take this journey together, don't forget if you just tap the video, there's a little cogwheel in the top right corner I got you all set up. I film in 6K, scaled to 4K, so you can go to advanced settings and you have perfect video quality. You also have dynamic surround sound for those that are listening in the ear pods or on a surround sound system. So just wanna let you know, we hook you up over here at the wheelhouse. And I just came across some really good information pertaining to the FTX bankruptcy filings and some new dirty little tidbits that have come out from years ago from Alameda employees risk management that left because they saw these problems coming years ago. So make sure you stay tuned for that information. And look, do me a little hookup. Right below the video, there's a like button. Smash it, fondle it, love it. Do whatever you want, get a running start. I don't care, just hit it, baby. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, we got that Twitter, that Instagram, and that YouTube. So select all. And let's take a look at the market cap, the bubbles, and then some news. All right, here we are. Today's cryptocurrency prices by market cap. The global crypto market cap is at 855.5 billy. That's a little bit better than it has been over the last week. Slightly down since yesterday but still holding above 850 billion, that's good. Let's take a look at the crypto prices. All right, starting with Bitcoin. We finally broke out of that little trader range from 16.2 to 16.7. We are now right above it at $17,022. That's progress, that's good. Ethereum at 1,280, that's also good. Uh, BNB at 293. Ripple, almost 40 cents. Dogecoin, almost 10 and a half cents. Cardano, about 31 and a half cents. Uh, Matic, 92 cents. That's gone up quite a bit. Polkadot, $5.45. Litecoin, 77.50. Uh, Solana, 13.61. Still struggling on Solana. So let's look at the crypto bubbles for the day and see what's going on. So when I look at the bubbles, it's a mixed bag and I expect it because we're not going to really see crypto run hot until we get more information on the FTX contagion and you know what's going to happen with Genesis, BlockFi, Voyager, Celsius, you know, is Binance buying? What's happening at these congressional hearings? What's going to happen with regulation? There's a lot to stay on top of. It's very important that we do stay on top of it. That's why I want you to select all so that every time I put a video out, you're getting notified. Okay, and watch it all the way through because I'm not wasting my time or your time. I'm going to put good information, highly researched, good information from good sources in these videos. Okay, now let's just take a look at a little bit of the news. And the generous view is that you are a young man who made a series of terrible, terrible, very, very bad decisions. The less generous view is that you have committed a massive fraud, that this is a Ponzi scheme manipulation of the system and I want to start there because I think that there are so many people who have that question which is what is this and what did happen and at the end of the day I, I was CEO of FTX and 
that means whatever happened, why ever it happened, I had a duty. I had a duty to all of our stakeholders, to our customers, uh, our creditors. I had a duty to our employees, to our investors, and, and to the regulators in the world uh, to do right by them, to make sure the right things happen to the company. And uh, clearly, I didn't do a good job of that. Um, clearly, I um, I made a lot of mistakes or, or things I would give anything to be able to do over again. Um, I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. I. I was excited about the prospects of FTX a month ago. Um, I saw it as a thriving, growing business. I was shocked by what happened this month. And, you know, reconstructing it, I, where are there things I wish I had done differently? One of the, the letters I got, uh, I want to read to you, Sam, um, because it's from a gentleman who said that he lost his life savings. Um, and the subject line is, Sam Bankman-Fried stole $2 million from me says, Andrew, can you please ask SBF why he decided to steal my life savings and the $10 billion more from customers to give to his hedge fund, Alameda? Can you ask him why his hedge fund was leveraging long all of these S-coins? I'm going to keep it polite for the kids. Please ask him if he thinks, the, thinks what happened was fraud. These are the kinds of letters that I've been getting repeatedly over the past several days. What do you tell this this man? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm deeply sorry about what happened. Um, here's, you know, the long and short of what happened. And, and I'll start by saying, uh, just to, to make a distinction here, you look at the US platform, you look at the international platform. The US platform uh, is a US regulated platform with American users. To my knowledge, that's fully solvent. That's fully funded, and uh, you know, I believe that withdrawals could be opened up today, and everyone could be made whole from that. That none of these problems plague the the U.S. platform. Um, then you look at the international platform, uh, you know, for their non-U.S. users, and uh, I mean, as the letter says, uh, Alameda Research did have a long position. And the international platform, it's a margin trading platform. It's a derivatives platform. It's a platform where all the clients were, you know, going on, placing something as collateral and using that to put on a position, whether that's a futures position, a spot position, a borrow. Um, and, you know, what the exchange was storing was the collateral from all of those positions. Uh, Alameda Research was, you know, one of those that put on positions there. And as I try and reconstruct this, um, you know, over the last month, I, I have limited access to data, but um, my, 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 my view of it um, from what I have been able to see is roughly that, um, you know, basically, look, a year ago, um, Alameda had, I think, something like 10% leverage, you know, had something like 10 times the assets of the position that it had on. Over the course of the last year, there were a number of market crashes. Um, that drove the value of those assets down and the leverage up. Um, I think it was, to my knowledge, still under 2x leverage, you know, as of uh, a month ago. Um, you look at the, what happened this month, and, uh, you know, in a few days, all out, um, I mean, PR assault, which led to a total market collapse in a pretty short period of time, no bid side liquidity. Um, uh, and more than $10 billion wiped off in the matter of days. And uh, realistically speaking, no ability for FTX to be able to, to liquidate that position and generate everything that was owed from and I think it. the bigger question is where Alameda got the loan from, yeah. which is to say that there is a view that this is about commingling of funds. Right. And, and, and in that letter uh, that I just read you, um, this gentleman actually copy and pasted the terms of service for FTX into the email. And I just want to read you this. It says, none of the digital assets in your account are the property of or shall or may be loaned to FTX trading. FTX trading does not represent or treat digital assets and users accounts as belonging to FTX trading. So how is it possible that Alameda had this loan of such a large size? So there is that piece from the terms of service. 
Um, but there were a number of other parts of the terms of service and a number of other parts of the platform on top of that. There is the borrow lending facility where users were lending billions of dollars of assets to each other, um, you know, collateralized by assets on the exchange. Um, you had, uh, and you had obviously futures contracts where there are leverage positions on. Now, of course, all of this, um, it, it's meant to be the case that these are positions where FTX could, uh, if it needed to, margin call those positions and close them down in time such that it would cover all of those, uh, you know, all those shorts, all those liabilities. Obviously, that wasn't the case here. And that's a massive failure of oversight, of risk management, um, and of uh, you know, diffusion of responsibility from, from myself running FTX. But, um, but, but just, but just yeah. make this very straight. Was there commingling of funds? That's what it appears like. It appears like there's a, been a, a genuine commingling of the funds that are of FTX customers that were not supposed to be commingled with your separate firm. I didn't knowingly commingle funds. And again, one piece of this, you have the margin trading. You have, you know, customers borrowing from each other. Alameda is one of those. I was frankly surprised by how big Alameda's position was, which points to another failure of oversight on my part. Um, and uh, failure to appoint someone to be chiefly in charge of that. Uh, but uh, I wasn't trying to commingle funds. Let me ask you this. The Wall Street Journal reported that Carol and Ellison um, told Alameda staffers that Alameda used FTX client funds to cover loans that were being recalled because of the Luna triggered credit crunch. Carolyn says that she, Sam, Gary were aware of this. How do you square that with what you originally said over Twitter, that this was an $8 billion accounting mistake? There are a few things here. I want to talk about the timeline of events because that is something that Andrew Ross Sorkin is drilling in on very deeply. If you all remember, there was a series of tweets. There was a tweet November 7th that he had deleted about the assets being fine. Now, he did say that on November 6th, he started to become nervous that FTL, FTX would not be able to fill customer withdrawals. Uh, these timelines are really important here, Caroline, because at the end of the day, and Sorkin also asked this, is his lawyers okay with him being up there speaking about this? This will all be cataloged and looked at at the end of the day when you look at what happened here at FTX, both in November as well as the full year. He's really been trying to draw a very big distance between himself and his role at FTX and Alameda, uh, and is you know really apologizing for not knowing and saying maybe he should have known. But Sorkin is also drilling in here very much so on why there seemingly was uh, joint roles when it came to assets that they both seem to have some exposure to. When I say they both, I mean both Alameda as well as Sam Bankman-Fried, who is a large owner of Alameda, as we know. I didn't knowingly commingle funds. Why is that an important statement? Because at the end of the day, I wasn't trying to commingle funds, he said. I did not ever try to commit fraud on anybody. So but we're gonna be looking at the series of events as things go on, as well as intent there. Mm -hmm. So that is something that he had said that day. You were asking about uh, the Bahamas as well. He, this is interesting. He was asked about why certain uh, Alameda employees had worked together. He had said he had not been living there uh, recently. We don't know how long he has or has not been living there. He had also said that he, uh, he would not be surprised if sometime I am up there talking about what happened with our representatives. Our representatives meaning U.S. representatives in that statement. Uh, he said he has been in the Bahamas for the last year. As we know though, uh, it, before this crisis had happened, he had been between the Bahamas and the U.S. He had been in D.C. a lot. I was in D.C. talking to him just weeks ago, really, uh, before this implosion had happened. And he said he'd been running between FTX and the Bahamas, uh, running from FTX in the Bahamas. But uh, he does say that he was asked about his concern about criminal liability here. He said he had a bad month, but what matters here is millions of customers. He did not really give a straight answer about whether the criminal liability is whether why, the reason why he is not coming to the United States in person. Yeah. All right, guys, so what do you think? I mean, I saw a lot of ands and ums and stutters and placing the blame on Alameda and a lot of crosstalk and circle jerking and... You know, for a guy that seems to know so much about his business, he he certainly had a momentary lapse of uh, memory. We'll call that a memory of a goldfish. But then all of a sudden, you know, when he started talking about, 
you know, the inner workings of everything of the derivatives market, he, he snapped right into it and knew everything about his business again. You know, my feeling is, is this has, you know, fraud all over it. The guy took user funds. There was a problem from Terra Luna, multiple collapses. Like he said, the value came down, like he said, and the collateralization against the margin, which he said 10% and then 10 X, which is two different things, by the way, Sam Bankman Fried. Uh, yeah. So I'm not buying it. I'm calling BS on all of it. This is a PR stunt and you know, I just feel bad for everybody that has lost money and for, for, you know, retail, but also, you know, there's been a lot of money and a lot of contagion from firms and hedge funds and even institutional uh, contagion. We don't know how far it goes and we'll see how things develop. If there's indictments and congressional hearings and we'll see more, but I have a feeling that some of the stuff that he's pointing out in this article is pretty accurate and most likely will come to fruition. Let's take a look. So this is written by David Z. Morris, okay? And he's the chief insights columnist uh, for Coindesk. And he writes, FTX collapse was a crime, not an accident. Sam Bankman Freed is a con man and fraudster of historic proportions, but you might not learn that from the New York Times. In the weeks since Sam Bankman Freed's cryptocurrency empire was revealed to be a house of lies, mainstream news organizations and commentators have often failed to give their readers a straightforward assessment of exactly what happened. First, we have the Alameda connection. At the heart of Bankman Freed's fraud are the deep and literally intimate ties between FTX, the exchange that enticed retail speculators, and Alameda Research, a hedge fund that Bankman Freed co-owned. Next, we have the FTT print and collateralized loans. The initial spark that set FTX and Alameda Research on fire was Coindesk reporting on the proportion of Alameda's balance sheet made up of the FTX exchange token FTT. This instrument was created by FTX, but only a tiny portion of it was traded in public markets. With FTX and Alameda holding the vast majority, this meant those holdings were effectively illiquid, impossible to sell at the open market price, Nonetheless, Bankman Freed accounted for its value at that fictitious market price. Next, he writes Alameda's margin liquidation exemption. In legal filings by the new CEO handling FTX bankruptcy and liquidation, it was reported that Alameda Research had special status as a user on FTX, a secret exemption from the platform's liquidation and margin trading rules. Next, he writes about Alameda front running FTX listings. So according to crypto analytics from Argus, there is strong circumstantial evidence that Alameda Research had insider access to information about FTX's plans to list particular tokens. Because an exchange listing usually has a positive impact on the price of a token, Alameda was able to buy large amounts of these tokens before the listing, then sell them after the listing bump. I mean, that is definitely uh, illegal to do that, to front run. So... <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be a problem. That's called insider trading. We went over that in the last video. Next, he writes immense personal loans to executives. So executives at FTX reportedly received a total of 4.1 billion in loans from Alameda Research, including massive personal loans that were likely unsecured. As revealed by bankruptcy proceedings, Bankman Freed received an incredible $1 billion in personal loans, as well as a $2.3 billion loan to an entity called Paperbird, in which he had 75% control. And he goes on to write about secretive purchase of a U.S. bank. So examiners have now discovered that Alameda Research invested $11.5 million into the minuscule Farmington State Bank which is a community bank, an amount more than double the bank's prior net worth. This may be illegal even in a vacuum, as both a non-US entity and investing firm, Alameda should have cleared a number of regulatory hurdles before it could acquire a controlling interest in a US bank. And he goes on to write why the mainstream media is getting it wrong. 
These are complex and in many cases nuanced forms of fraud, largely echoing, it must be said, well-established models in the traditional finance world. That obscurity is one reason Bankman Freed was able to masquerade as an honest player and has likely helped keep coverage softer even after the collapse. Okay, what he's saying is number one, the Alameda connection. Okay, Sam Bankman Freed having ownership in both is a conflict of interest. Number two, front running. As FTX is going to list certain tokens, Alameda would buy huge amounts of supply prior to the listing, which would make them a ton of money. Front running is insider trading. Number three, printing of the FTT tokens, beefing up the balance sheet to raise capital, and then keeping most of the supply in house. And then we find out that BlockFi and Voyager had a lot of FTT token and when they fell not only did he want to look like the white knight but he wanted to cover up the margin leverage of the ftt token and then of course he talks about all the personal loans and the misuse of user funds your money and other investors money now let's take a quick look at what gary gensler saying and then let's listen to what the personnel of risk management at alameda research said recently of why they quit, how they warned Sam Bankman Freed of his compliance issues and what changes should be made. And because he didn't make those changes, they quit and they quit years ago because they saw so many problems that were going to happen. And now they've happened. Let's take a listen. Filing the new CEO of FTX, John J. Ray, says the crypto exchange displayed a quote, complete failure of corporate controls, and said there was a complete absence of trustworthy financial information. But former employees say that laissez-faire attitude toward risk and compliance extended back into founder Sam Bankman-Fried's history. Former staff at his trading firm Alameda Research say years earlier they quit in part because of the way Bankman Freed handled risk and accounting issues. So what can that history teach us about what went down at FTX? Joining us to discuss this is special writer for the Wall Street Journal, Gregory Zuckerman. Hi Greg, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. You know, a lot of people have heard of FTX since the crisis with it began, and now a lot of people have heard of Alameda Research because of that. But can you take us through the creation of Alameda? I mean, how did it get started? Of course. So Sam Bankman Free, the man who's at the helm of this crypto exchange that's collapsed, called FTX. After MIT, after working at a firm called Jane Street, a trading firm, he left to start something called Alameda Research. This was going to be a firm that would focus on cryptocurrencies and trade them, a quasi hedge fund type of firm. And this was, we're talking 2017, about two years before he started FTX. So the first business he started was Alameda Research. Now, some former employees of Alameda Research are saying they quit in part over Bankman Freed's risk tolerance. What kind of risks are they describing in their accounts? What sort of criticism are they putting out there? Yes, what happened was early on, we're talking the fall of 2017, a rift developed in this new young trading firm. A senior employee, senior staffers, senior traders started to get nervous at what Sam Bankman Freed was doing or rather what he wasn't doing. What he wasn't doing was embracing, accepting, just sort of conventional, proper, standard risk controls, accounting measures, compliance, the kind of stuff that most everybody else in the trading world is fine with. Measurements of who's doing what with the money, where the money is going, how much they're making, what's being allocated. They had money for their firm, you know, buying desks, buying computers, that kind of thing. And they had money to trade and it was being commingled, mixed together. And it all worried people at the firm. And they said to Sam, hey, we can't trade like this. We, we need better measurements, accounting and otherwise to, to kind of judge um, where the money's going. And he resisted their efforts to incorporate uh, and embrace some of these risk accounting and other measures. Why is that such a big deal? Frankly, the early employees point to the recent problems and say, well, geez, 
what we were worried about, that was a foreshadowing of the problems that were ahead. And in some ways it says to us uh, from the outside that, wow, these problems could have been avoided had Sam Bankman-Fried embraced the suggestions of his colleagues. How do we know all this information? So we spoke to a number of people close to the matter, so a series of interviews, and there were documents. There were contemporaneous documents written by Sam Bankman-Fried in 2018 to explain the rift, to explain the split, why so many senior people left his firm. Has Sam Bankman-Fried responded to any of these criticisms? So what Sam Bankman-Fried has said is that yes, early on at the firm, there was a rift, there was a fight, there was pushback. His colleagues were upset at him for these very reasons. The fact that he resisted the accounting and, and other controls, compliance, etc. But what he said is that subsequently, uh, he did make some changes in terms of being a better boss, listening to his employees, having more transparency. So I think he would argue that, well, some of the recommendations that they pushed for, yes, I resisted them initially, but later I embraced them. I mean, you mentioned that they raised these concerns with Bankman Freed, but did they raise them with anyone else? Yeah, Zoe, so they did raise these concerns and share them with others, in particular with some of the early investors in the firm. And they said to some of their early investors, hey, um, this firm, Alameda Research and Sam Bankman Freed, are not trading properly and not starting, they're not initiating their firm in a proper way. And that was kind of it. It's important to keep in mind that we're talking a period, again, the fall of 2017 through the spring of 2018, when this firm, Alameda Research, was relatively small, did not have any individual investors. It's not clear they would have been able to get anyone's attention. One of the big issues in this crypto bankruptcy is how customers' funds from FTX were used for investments by Alameda Research. On Wednesday, Bankman Freed was speaking at the DealBook Summit, and he said he didn't knowingly co-mingle the funds and said it was a failure of oversight on his part. But I wonder if knowing more about what went on in the early years of Alameda Research will help with understanding the fall of FTX. You know, will it help customers regain some of their money or at least, you know, know what happened? Well, it's a good question. I think it sheds light on the firm, his management style, his approach to risk, his approach to accounting. I think it could undercut an argument, perhaps from Bank and Freed and, and others. They may come and argue, well, you know, we didn't know any better. We just started this firm and we, yeah, we messed up and we're really sorry, but we were just, you know, young guys cut us some slack. And what I think our article kind of shows is there were early warnings and there were concerns issued by colleagues of Sam Baker and Freed. Sam is delusional about what happened and his culpability in it, right? He needs to be prosecuted. Uh, he will spend time in jail. 